Good evening and God bless you. It is time for us to now begin our Wednesday evening Bible study. It's just a few minutes after 7 p.m. and I want to thank all of you again for joining us on this very tragic, um, very painful uh, day that we have experienced here in Northern California. Our prayers go out uh, to the families and uh, people who have lost their lives tragically in San Jose and all of their loved ones. Uh, we pray for the community at large. Um, we pray that there would be some peace to come out of all of this horrible events that are taking place here in uh, this country with the violence that we are all witness to. So our hearts are heavy tonight. We're going to proceed with our Bible study and uh, pray that God would provide to us some direction on how we should walk through these treacherous times that we now live in. I want to acknowledge those who are on our conference line tonight. God bless you and thank you for calling in. Those of you that are on Facebook Live, may God continue to bless you as well. We begin tonight as we always do with a brief devotional. And tonight I'm going to ask that you would get your Bible and turn uh, to the 12th chapter of the book of Romans as we look at the first two verses. Now these are uh, verses that are very familiar to most believers. Many of you have read it over and over again. But tonight for our devotional, I just feel that the Spirit is leading me to, to suggest to you through this text that every one of us has something to prove. We have something to prove in the midst of all that is going on God intends for us to take the high road I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12 as I read verse 1 and 2 and then we'll speak a few moments and have prayer and begin our lesson for tonight Paul says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So tonight, the devotional leads me to suggest to you that we all have something to prove. Now, when I use the word prove, we often think about trying to establish something as true or not true. That is our first thought, to prove something as fact. But another way of looking at the word prove is to establish the authenticity of something, the genuineness of something. If you're going to prove that something is genuine, prove that something is authentic, it often has to go through some sort of a testing, some sort of an evaluation. Paul says for every one of us who are believers that we have something to prove. We have to establish our genuineness, our authenticity. And how do we do that? We do that by establishing that we will not conform to the world that surrounds us, but we will make choice to be transformed, to be changed. Now, how does that happen? It happens when we submit to the Holy Spirit and allow the Spirit to quicken us, to make us alive, to begin to shape us in the nature of Jesus Christ, to give us a new nature. You see, what Paul says in this text for our devotional is this. He says, you have to bring what you have. Bring what you have and give it to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Give it to the Lord as holy, as set apart. Give it to the Lord as something that is acceptable to him. You see, what I want to tell you tonight is what you have is what God desires. He gave to you your gifts, your talents, your abilities. 
He has shaped you and formed you to the person that you are, and all that he asks is that you give it to him fully and completely. Yes, we have something to prove. What we have to prove is that we will not submit to the ways of the world and conform to what the world suggests is the best way to respond. No, we have to be transformed. Transformed by the renewing of our mind through the aid of the Holy Spirit so that we can become the image of Christ to the world. We have something to prove. You have something to prove. And if we just allow ourselves to give ourselves totally and completely to the Lord as a living sacrifice, he will indeed use us for his glory. In spite of the things that are going on around us, in spite of the things that are happening to us, there's glory in our story, in your story. So I'm going to pray with you tonight as we begin our Bible study, and we're going to pray in particular for the grieving families, for those who are so broken today as a result of the tragic uh, deaths in the San Jose area, the, the murders and subsequent suicide of the shooter, and for our nation as a whole. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to first of all come before you praying, Lord, for comfort for the many, many people whose hearts are now broken, people who have no way to know what to do next. But Lord, I pray that your spirit would comfort those who seek you for comfort. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk through this valley, this valley of evil, of hatred, bigotry. I pray, Lord, that you would keep us as the good shepherd from straying from your will. And as the word declares tonight, help us not to conform, conform to fear, conform to doubt, conform to hatred, retribution, or evil, but let us be transformed today to show love, grace, forgiveness, mercy, gentleness, kindness. Help the fruit of the Spirit to become, Lord, true for us. I pray for those who have joined us for our Bible study, Lord, that they would, that they would somehow receive a word today that would help them in their walk. I thank you for the privilege you've given me to share this lesson tonight. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, dear Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Well, God bless you again. I want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you're ready for us to just jump right into this lesson. We're going to just, just plow right in. Uh, we're in 1 Peter. I've titled this lesson, as you all know by now, Victory Under Pressure. It was Peter's intent to share this with the believers with the Christians of his time, but it's the Word of God, so it's intended uh, to be relevant for all times. They were facing opposition, they were facing oppression, uh, they were facing attack, isolation. Uh, doesn't that sound familiar? Uh, they were not uh, embraced by the world that they lived in at the time. Doesn't that sound familiar? And they were trying to determine how their walk with God could help them to overcome these challenges. What does the Bible tell us that is expected of us in times such as these? Can we have victory under this kind of pressure? How can we present our bodies as a living sacrifice? How can we be transformed in the midst of all that is going on? What does God have to say about this? So Peter wrote this letter, and he wrote it to uh, Christians who were in the Roman uh, Empire, uh, Nero had burned most of the city of Rome. They were attacking the Christians and using them as scapegoats. Uh, and uh, so Peter wanted to make certain that the Christians who received this knew uh, what God's uh, will was for the time. So as we've opened up the lesson and we've talked already from chapter 1 and through most of chapter 2, when we closed off last week, what we were talking about at that time is is how Peter, at this point in the, in the lesson, at this point in the letter, he had already established their identity. He had already established the identity of all of us as believers. Verse number 9, chapter number 2 of, of 1 Peter, 
Uh, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Uh, Peter had already established in the first chapter and into the second chapter of who we are as believers. But then here in verse number nine, what he says is this, as this is important because he transitions from who we are to how we should live. If you know who you are, it ought to impact how you live. If you know who you are, it ought to impact how you think. If you know who you are, you won't conform to the world, but you'll be transformed by the renewed mind that you have as a result of the knowledge that you've received of who you are. Who am I now that I am born again? And so what Peter says in verse number nine is this. He says, this is who you are, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We've talked about that. And then he goes on to say that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, you are all of this so that you can do that. Do what? Show forth his praises. He is the one, the Lord, who has brought you out of that darkness into his marvelous light. Now that you know who you are, this is what you do. You show forth his praise. And so we spent the last week and perhaps a little bit before that talking about how do, you, how do I show forth his praise? How do I acknowledge that I am who I know I am? How do I begin to become that transformed person that no longer conforms to the world, but is transformed by the renewing of the mind? How do I prove myself? How do I establish the authenticity of who I am, the genuineness of my faith? It ought to matter to you, because it certainly matters to God, that your lifestyle conforms with your beliefs. That's fundamentally what a Christian uh, ought to be doing. Uh, to be like Christ is what a Christian is, to be like Christ. So what does that mean in terms of how we begin to demonstrate that. Well, we talked about how you, uh, in verse number nine, how we begin to show forth his praise. And Peter gave four key areas of conduct that we must see a change in. We should see this is a transformed mind in the way that we conduct ourselves as spiritual witnesses. We talked about this last week. Our witness is not in the words that we profess, but in the lifestyle and the conversation that we have. We have to first be it, meaning it has to change us before we do it. If it hasn't first hit your heart, it doesn't matter what you do. And so we talked about this at length, about how our witness is our work, the things that we do. And so first of all, he talks about our conduct as witnesses, which represents uh, the fact that our lifestyle ought to communicate what we believe. The second thing that he communicates is the, our conduct as citizens, how we live in civil interactions in relationship to government and authority ought to be different for a believer as opposed to one who is not a believer. That isn't to say that somebody who isn't saved can't obey the laws. But as we learned last week, those who are saved don't obey the laws for fear of punishment from man. We obey the law because we know that the Lord is watching. We do it for the Lord. So that means that even those laws that we don't like, we obey them anyway. Even when we recognize that we may not get caught, we do it anyway. Why? Because we are doing it for the Lord. And so as a Christian, what motivates us to live in conformity with authority is the realization that all authority has been delegated by God. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, whether you like the person in office or not, when we submit to authority, we are submitting to the delegated authority that comes from God. And as a Christian, the only Thing that we can do contrary to legitimate authority 
is if that authority gives us a law or command that directly contradicts the revealed word of God, the will of God, then in that instance, we obey God rather than man. But we aren't simply given permission. We don't have the liberty as a Christian. Now, we talked about all this last week, so I'm not going to go into detail. But we don't have the liberty as a Christian to say that I, simply because I don't like the law, I don't like the rule, that because I'm a Christian, because I'm part of the kingdom of God, that I'm exempted from it. No, it's exactly the opposite. Whether we like it or not, whether we like the, the person who is in charge or not, we must submit to that because all authority is delegated authority. And you remember last week, we covered those first two. We talked about our conduct. This is how we show praises. This is how we demonstrate that we know our identity. We show our praise by the conduct that we have in our witness. We show our praise by the conduct that we have as citizens in civil interactions. And then we mentioned to you last week that Peter then gives a a little uh, sidebar, which we closed on last week, where he began to talk about the principles of conduct. What are the fundamental principles of Christ our code of conduct as a Christian? Uh, what, are, what are those things that ought to, uh, ought to guide our perceptions about things? How, how do we as Christians govern ourselves as far as basic principles are concerned? And there were four things that we talked about Last week we closed on this. Number one, we have to, in verse number 17, for those of you that weren't with us, this is where you'll find this. He says in verse number 17, what we need to do is four things. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. These are the principles on which all of our conduct must be governed. And as we closed out last week, we broke each one of these down to say, essentially, we have to respect and value everyone for who they are as individuals. That's, that's honoring all men, whether, they, whether, whether uh, you, they're the same skin color or same language, same nationality or not. We should have a mutual respect for all human beings because we're all created in the image of God. If that's a principle that we have within us, It'll affect our interactions with people. We'll treat people with decency and respect. That's fundamental to what we ought to do as a Christian. Second thing Peter says is that we will love the brotherhood, which means love other believers. Now, this is a second step. We talked about this at the end of the lesson last week. Respecting the, all humanity is one thing, but loving other believers is another level because there's a mutuality among believers we're all one body in Christ he is the head we're many members and yet one we are intermingled with one another as part of the body as so goes one in the kingdom so goes all in the kingdom therefore we should pray for one another edify one another encourage one another there's the assumption that the Holy Spirit is working in all of us to draw us closer together. When they were all on one accord, the Bible says, on the day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came. When we come together in koinonia, that is fellowship, there is a uniqueness about the body of Christ. Whether we go to the same church building or not, we are still one organism and we should love one another. And so we talked about that at some length. We're not going to continue that lesson. But then we talked about the next principle, which is to say, fear God. You see, uh, we need to reverence God. If we have a healthy reverence for God, then it'll shape not only how we respond to what he tells us to do, but also the things that we do in relationship to others, because we know that God is watching. And finally, he says, honor the king, which is to honor governmental authority. Those Four principles are principles that underlie all of the areas of our interactions with people. So let's continue now as we go down to verses 18 through 21. First Peter chapter number two. Go with me to 18 through 21. And here he's continuing his dialogue related to the four conduct areas that we started on a few weeks ago. These four areas of conduct he chooses to highlight as areas that can help us to show forth his praise, the Lord's praise, as the one who has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, now that we've seen the light, now that we know our identity, 
It ought to affect how we interact as citizens. It ought to affect how we interact with others in our witness. And it also ought to affect how we interact with others in commerce, in business, in employment. Now here we're going to have a difficult time. Because as we read verse 18 through 21, we have to understand the time and the circumstances under which this was written. It was written during a time when slavery was a common practice. Now, not all people who were slaves were slaves due to uh, um, um, being um, abducted or victims of war. Some individuals were indentured servants because they did so as a way in which to um, to pay off debt or to uh, work for others for a period of time in order to be able to be given land or to be able to um, establish themselves. Not all slavery is of the same nature that uh, black Americans have experienced or others who may have experienced in the past. But the term slavery is one that uh, certainly raises red flags. Peter's purpose was not to cast judgment on the system that existed at the time, but to help us to understand the conduct that we must operate under within the system that we live in. So let us look at this text, 18th verse through the 21st verse of chapter number 2, Peter, 1 Peter. Look at what he says. Now this section is dealing with commercial issues, commerce, business issues. Let me share it with you. Verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. I read from the King James Version. Again, I remind you, you can use any translation that you wish. For this is thankworthy. Verse number 19. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Look at that. Leaving us an example that you should show, that you should follow his steps. So here's the key. The things that Peter is, is describing here are intended for us to model ourselves, pattern ourselves after Christ. Understand, when the temptation for us to, to feel uh, abused or taken advantage of or to feel misused or to feel that it isn't fair, that's the wrong perspective. Again, victory under pressure. What I must begin to do is to see myself as modeling my life after Christ. After all, I am showing forth his praises. Remember verse number nine, as a believer, it's not my will, but thy will be done. I am showing forth his praises as the one who has brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. So let us go further here. Peter is addressing here those who were household servants or domestic workers who made up a high percentage of the early church and often experienced undeserved punishment and suffering. The reality was in that time, there were people who suffered severely while working for others, servants, and in some cases, slaves. The principle here is one that applies to any situation where unjust suffering occurs. The master in this case could be the employer. Thus, even if your boss 
is not a good and fair boss, we still must do what is asked. I know I, I hear some people gulping here. I understand that this is not an easy word, but we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're not conforming. It is not easy to, to be patient when you are in an environment where you aren't always given a fair shake. And so what we must remember is what Peter is saying is that we have to model our response after Jesus Christ. He suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Let's go to Luke chapter number 6, verses 32 through 35. Luke chapter number 6. All right, Luke chapter, uh, chapter number 6. All right, verse 32 through... 35. Turn with me, if you would, to that now. Let's see what it says here. Verse 32. Are you there? All right. For if you love them who love you, what thanks have you? For sinners also love those who love them. This is Jesus talking. And if you do good to them... Who do good to you, what thanks have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thanks have you? For sinners also lend to sinners, <coughs> excuse me, to receive as much again. Look at verse number 35. But love your enemies. And do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the sons of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. So listen, my friends. Jesus says that if our response to others in commerce in business relationship is always predicated on the fact that they will treat us fairly, will provide us with the right um, evaluations, performance evaluations and, and wages and opportunities. Anybody can do that. It stands to reason that you would be positively influenced by an employer that kept on rewarding you. But Jesus says, in those instances where you aren't recognized, in those cases where you don't necessarily get everything that is due, don't think for a moment that the Lord ignores you for being patient, for still trying to be a good employee, for still trying to do your best. Because this is how you show forth your praise as one who has been brought out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is how, as Paul would say, you prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You prove something by going through something. You prove your legitimacy when you go through something. You prove your identity and your genuineness when you go through something. If you've never had to stand the test, if you've never had to go through the fire, if you've never had to face uh, a, 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 an employer or a uh, area of business where you were not, where you were treated unfairly, then you have no knowledge yourself of just how how strong you can be spiritually. And so it is that we must recognize that what Peter is saying is that even in those instances where uh, your employer or where your boss or where your supervisor is not treating you fairly, you cannot conform and fight evil with evil as a Christian. 
all of this, my friends, understand, is predicated on the reality that we have the Holy Spirit in us. And the Holy Spirit in us will give us the strength to be able to withstand in the evil day. Let's go forward now back to 1 Peter. Back to 1 Peter chapter number 2. I want you to look at verse number 19 in chapter number 2. And what's it say in verse number 19 of 1 Peter? It says, this is thankworthy. He says, if you endure when you're subject to um, uh, things that uh, a, a, a master or an employer that is, that is offensive, he said, this is thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God endures grief. You see that in verse 19, 1 Peter chapter number 2 in the King James Version. The word thankworthy is not a common word that we see very often. And in fact, it's, it's not necessarily the best translation, but it is the one that we have in the King James Version. The word thankworthy comes from a Greek word, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, charis, which is translated more often in the New Testament as the word grace. So think about this. The word thankworthy in verse number 19 comes from the same word that is most often translated as grace in the New Testament or gracious. So therefore, what this is saying is this. When we endure under harsh consequences, what we are actually doing is demonstrating Grace. It's an act of grace when for conscience towards God we endure grief and suffering wrongly. What is grace? Unmerited favor. In other words, we're giving something that is not the result of something we've received. It is grace. And so it is. When you look at now verse number 20, look at verse number 20 in 1 Peter chapter number 2. You see in verse number 20 where it says, For what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is is acceptable with God. You see that? This is acceptable with God. Let me tell you something. The word acceptable in verse number 20 is the same word that is thankworthy in verse number 19. In other words, in verse 20, what is translated as acceptable to God is really the word that is translated as grace most often in the New Testament. So what does this mean? This means our submission, listen, this means our submission to undeserved suffering finds favor, is acceptable with God because such behavior demonstrates his grace. So what ought to motivate us then when we suffer wrongly? We want to show forth his praise to the world. We want to demonstrate that we've come out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so it is that when we suffer wrongfully and take it patiently, this is something that demonstrates his grace. It's acceptable with God. It is a gracious act of God. It is a gracious thing to do. It's thankworthy. So what Peter would say, as clearly as it is written in the text, there's no glory in taking punishment when you're doing wrong. You can't go around and say, I'm a Christian. I'm going to take my lickings and keep on going even though I just did something wrong. No, there's no glory in that. But if we are persecuted for doing good, 
God's grace, listen, God's grace will always sustain us. Let me say that again. The text says it. It's right here in verse number 20. It says it is acceptable. This is acceptable with God. The word acceptable is grace or gracious. So in other words, when you take something, even when it's not something you deserve, what this results in is that God's grace will sustain you. So let's go to verse number 21. And here Peter says something that I think we often just read through. So somebody once said, why me? Why me, Lord? Why do I have to always be the one that gets uh, taken advantage of? Why me, Lord, when I'm always trying to do the right thing? Am I the one left behind? Why me, Lord, when I'm always the honest one on the job? Everybody who's dishonest and cutting corners seems to be promoted. Why me, Lord? Why me when you know I'm trying to live right? The question is the wrong question. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. Peter tells you why. We'll get to it here in verse number 21. The question is, why not you? If Jesus had to suffer for those who did not appreciate him, did not recognize him, if Jesus suffered, why not me? I'm following in his steps. You're following in his steps. You're showing forth his praise as the one who brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are the one who have come forward to say, I'm being transformed daily by the renewing of my mind to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Why not me? Look at what Peter has to say. Look at verse number 21. Verse 21 in the King James Version, it says, now, we've just talked about how his grace will sustain us if we've gone through, if we're buffeted, uh, and, and, and if, we're, if we suffer and take it patiently, his grace is with us. But look at verse 21. I want you to look at it. I want you to look closely at it. In the King James Version, it says, as it opens up, for even hereunto were you called. We need to, we need to hear what he's saying. He said, this is the reason you are in this place. It's so that God could show his grace through your struggle. You've been called for this. Why not me? Don't say, why me? The text says, it's you because God has assigned this to you. You are called for this. We are called for this. Look at what Jesus said. If anybody is going to follow behind me, let him pick up his cross daily and follow me. Listen, Jesus said, this is what comes with this. What you're going through right now is not just something that's just happening. It's what we've been called to do. And understand me, understand me. It's not like the God just wants to throw you out into the wolves. But what God wants to do is to let your light shine. Because there's darkness everywhere. There's a light in you. And if he doesn't put you in dark situations, how is your light going to shine? If he just kept you in a room full of light, your light would not shine as brightly. But when he allows you from time to time to fall into a dark dungeon of a situation, the light that is in you shines ever brighter. This is why you were called. Do you see it in the text? See, what Peter is trying to convey to them as well as to us, you have victory under pressure when you understand that wherever you are at this moment, God has allowed it for a reason. Peter says, we are called for this purpose. Christians are called to emulate Christ's character and conduct, patience and endurance in the face of injustice is part of God's purpose and plan for Christians. Let me say that again. Patience and endurance. Patience and endurance in the face of injustice is part of God's plan and purpose for Christians. I want to know if anybody's watching me here. I want you to touch the like button, touch, 
touch the little thumbs up, touch the little heart. If you're watching me on Facebook Live, I need to know somebody hears what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. This is what, this is what God has called us to do. God does not send injustice. God does not send injustice. Let me say that again. God doesn't send evil, but he turns it to our good. He uses the evil of the world in order to prove us. Fire proves the true gem from the stone, from the stubble. He allows what happens to prove us. God does not send injustice to us, but God looks for Christians to respond in a manner that affirms his grace. So we are to follow Christ's example in response to unjust suffering. Are you going through something right now that just doesn't feel right? We have to respond to it in a way that shines light on it. Not conform, but be transformed. Christ suffered so that it would be possible for Christians to follow his example, both in his suffering and in righteous living. Let me give you some scriptures real quick. Let's go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. And I want you to go to um, <clears throat> verse 38. Acts chapter 5, verse 38. And we're going to read through verse 42. Are you there? Acts chapter 5, verse 38, and we're going to read through verse 42. All right, and it says in verse number 38, Acts chapter 5, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to nothing. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Praise God. See, nothing that they do can stop what God has for you anyway. Nothing that anybody says can, can, can hold back God's promise for you anyway. So what? They don't give you the promotion. That's not the only way for you to get elevated, you know. God has the final say. If I had time, I'd tell you a story in my life. Somebody tried to hinder me from getting up. They're always trying to stand in the way. And before it was all over, God saw to it that they lost the job and I ended up having their position. And I didn't even apply for it. Can I get somebody to say hallelujah? Let me finish this text. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest perhaps you be found even to fight against God. That's verse number 39. Let me read verse 40 on. And it says in verse number 40, And, and to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and then let them go. So these were people... The Sanhedrin Council, the, 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 the religious leaders of the time, they were arresting Peter and John and other apostles and telling them they couldn't preach about Jesus. And then there was someone who said, wait a minute, y'all, ain't no point in trying to fight against these men because if God is in it, you can't stop it anyhow. So they, they brought them in, they beat them and said, okay, y'all, go on back out here, but you can't say nothing else about Jesus. Look at what it says in verse number 41, and it says, And they departed from the presence of the council, look at this, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They, they were rejoicing that they were the ones chosen to go through what they were going through. Don't ask the question, why me? Why not me? I want to show forth his praise as the one who brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why not me? Look what it says in verse number 42. It says, and daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So Peter says in verse uh, number 20, he says, 
It's for this purpose that you were called. And as we just looked in chapter 5 of Acts, when the apostles were beaten, they said, praise God that God has chosen me to be the one to endure this in his name. I'm going to go on and tell the world anyhow. I'm going to let my light shine. So even in our commerce, even in places of business where we work, even when we face employers that don't give us the respect and the entitlement that we have, we must go through that with patience, continuing to pray that God would allow your light to shine that he would open the doors that others would close for you. That he would close doors that some would try to keep open. God will do that. Let's look now at Romans chapter 12, verse 17 through 21. Go with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 17 through 21. All right. Are you there? Romans 12, 17 through 21. What's it say? Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place under wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. If he doesn't give you a raise, do the job well anyhow. I just threw that in there. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. If your performance out evaluation isn't fair, you keep doing the best job you can. What's that doing? That's putting coals of fire on their head. Sometimes they want to set you up. Sometimes they want to mess you up. Sometimes they want to change your, uh, your work output by putting things into your evaluation that just aren't true. But you're going to prove them wrong because you're going to continue to let the light of Christ shine through you. You're going to continue to do the work that you were assigned to do. Look at verse number 21. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. Amen. So let's go back to 1 Peter, chapter number 2. So what, what Peter has done here at this point in chapter number 2 is he's begun to talk about these areas of conduct. And I said, that the, excuse me, there were four. We've covered three of them. We've talked about the conduct that we have as witnesses. We've talked about the conduct that we have as citizens and civil activities in relationship to civil authority. We've talked about the conduct that we have in commerce and the relationship that we have in employment and business and other transactions. Now we're going to begin to talk about the conduct within the home, familial conduct, conduct particularly between husband and wife and how this shines the light, how this reveals the praise of him who has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're going to shift now to, ver to chapter number 3. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter number 3. Now here Peter is taught that living successfully as a Christian in a hostile world requires submission. He's repeated this over and over again. Submission to authority. Uh, submission uh, to the spirit and, and not the flesh. Submission uh, in, in our work and in, in those who have given authority over us in commerce. So he's focused on submission, as did Jesus. Jesus focused on submission. Um, submission in civil society, submission in the workplace. So at the start of this chapter, which is chapter 3, he's now going to be talking about submission in the family. In particular, we're going to be looking at the first seven verses of chapter number three. 
Here we'll begin to talk about the need for, for those in relationship in the family to recognize that there is order in the family structure. Order in the family structure. Let's look at verse 1 and 2. Go with me now to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, likewise, because we've also been talking, we've already talked about civil relationships, business relationships, we've talked about witness and, and, and daily life. Uh, now he says, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversion of, conversation of their wife by the conversation of their wife now in the king james version the word conversation we've explained before means lifestyle means conduct conversation is encompassing all the things that you do and all the things that you are it's your lifestyle not just the words you speak so let me say that again if any obey not the word meaning if the spouse is not a believer they also may without the word without you speaking be won by the lifestyle of their wives while they behold your chaste conversation lifestyle coupled coupled with fear so let's begin to talk about how this shows forth the praise of God so the ancient Greek word which which in the King James Version uh, subjection submission the ancient Greek word translated submit or submission was used uh, both in the Bible as well as in their practical life in the New Testament time. And what, what submission and subjection uh, really translates from is a term that was used commonly by soldiers in, the, in their army to those who were in superior rank. Soldiers conduct in response to those who were in superior rank was considered submission, was considered obedience. And what it literally means, the word submission, literally means to, or, to order under, to order under. In other words, to fall in line, to fall in line. Submission means to order under or to fall in line. So submission to order can be totally consistent with equality in importance. To submit to some authority, to submit to order, does not diminish in any way the person who is called on to submit, just like a soldier who submits to the order, to the authority in their unit, doesn't do so by diminishing their identity. They do so by respecting order. So submission to order can be totally consistent with equality in importance, dignity, and honor. It's considered an honorable thing for a soldier to submit to their order. It's an honorable thing. Jesus was subject to both his parents. It did not make him lower than them, but there was order. And submission to order is something that God ordains. Thus, the command for wives to be subject to their husband should not be taken to imply inferior personhood or inferior spirit, spirituality or lesser importance. Absolutely not. Order is something established by God in order to maintain unity, strength, and direction. God has established the order for the family. And so the text that 
Peter refers to here as he writes this out, likewise, wives be sub subject to your own husbands, does not diminish the wife's identity or personhood. In fact, women and men in a spiritual sense are considered equals, even if in the family order there is structure. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. All right? Turn with me to Matthew 22 and 30. All righty, let me share this with you. Jesus is talking... I'll start, uh, <clears throat> I'll start at verse number 29. Verse 29 says, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scripture, nor the power of God. Verse 30. For in the resurrection, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but all but are like the angels of God in heaven. So in heaven, once, once the resurrection occurred, marriage no longer exists. The order that's necessary in family relationships here on earth no longer exists. But rather in heaven, we will all be angels together, equal. So the order and structure necessary for cohesion and unity and focus here on earth is the result of the corrupted nature and the curse that sin has brought to the earth. God established order. And in so doing, the woman, the woman is to be subject to the order that God has established. But this does not diminish the woman's position spiritually, emotionally, or practically in the kingdom of God. For when we get to heaven, we're all going to be angels together. And so as a Christian woman, submitting to the order that God has established is something that we do to show forth the praises of him who brought us out of darkness into marvelous light. It is the one to whom we submit. When we submit to the order that's in the family, we are in essence submitting to the order that has been delegated by God. Let me give you just a few more words here and then we're going to break for tonight. So submission, we're still focusing on verse 1 and 2 of 1 Peter chapter 3. Submission flows from a position of strength. When a person submits, it is by choice, not by compulsion. Submission flows from a position of strength and dignity. When a person submits, it's by choice, not by compulsion. One who chooses to submit is always in the position to reassert their control. So submission in marriage follows the same principles as submission to civil authority. We submit to God's appointed authority as our obligation before God. And so when we submit to the authority and the order that God has established for the family, we do so under the authority of God. Not because he, the man, is greater than you, but because God, the creator, your father, has established the order. And so we submit to the order of God as he has designed it for the unity of the family. 
the only case in which order and in, in which we are not compelled to submit to authority or order is when that authority or order just as in the civil example with government when that authority or order leads us to act in ways that are directly contradictory to the revealed word of God. We are not compelled to submit to order when doing to, to authority when doing so causes us to sin against God. In that case, it is right to obey God rather than man. Last thing I want to share with you, and then we're going to close. How did we get to this place where verse 1 and 2 is even necessary of, of 1 Peter chapter number 3? Sin is the cause that led God to establish order in the family. Sin is the cause that led God to establish order in in the family. We're going to close with this text and then we'll come back next week and finish this. Um, go with me to Genesis chapter 3 verse 14. Genesis chapter 3 verse number 14. All right. And then we will close for the evening. Genesis 3, verse 14. I'll read verse 14 through 19. So sin is the cause of God establishing the order in the family to keep unity and focus, to keep us from continuing to stray from his divine and appointed will for his creation. Look at what it says in verse number 14, Genesis 3. It says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity uh, between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy heel, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That's order. That's the order that God established. Let's continue on, verse 17. And Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Verse 19, last verse. It says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So again, my friends, as we get back to Peter and we close out this evening, submission to your own husband is submission to the order that God has established for unity and focus in the family unit in order to confine us from straying from his appointed purpose and will for his creation. But it does not diminish the identity of the person who is doing the submitting. In fact, it's not a one-way street. Uh, there's also, as soon we'll see in this family structure, a joint responsibility both for the husband to the wife as much as there is for the wife to the husband. And we'll talk about this next week. So God bless you as we continue to talk about how to show forth his praise to the world. I'm going to open up the lines for any prayer requests or any comments, and then we will um, close out with prayer tonight. At this time, uh, the lines are, are now open. If there are any comments or questions, we'll take any comments or questions before we close out. Any comments or questions tonight before we close out with prayer? Yeah, Bishop, just uh, Deacon Jones, how you doing?
Hello? I'm good. Thank you, Dick. Well, uh, it, if they are evil, it's clear that they are doing something that is not uh, just, and it may not be just right. with just you, it may not be just with somebody else as well, but if their actions are not actions which are designed to compel you to go against the express will of God, if they are not asking you to go out and do something that is going against the express will of God, even if they, their conduct is evil, then the, 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 guide, the guidance of the scripture says we still need to do good, even to those who are evil. So we don't get, we don't get a pass on that, because our role in every situation is to be the light, to not conform. Because more often than not, when somebody is doing evil, they're trying to get you to respond in like kind by doing something evil. Because they've already labeled you as such anyway. So what we do as a believer is to not respond in like kind. We respond to evil with love. We respond to, to people who are not just with, um, with actions that are pure. So let me, say, let me say it in this way. We don't get a pass to kind of pull back on the throttle and say, well, they don't deserve 100% of my labor because they, they are, I know they're not right. I'm only going to give what I need because that's, I'm only going to give what I'm getting paid to do. What the Bible says is whatever we do, we need to, in word or deed, we must do it as unto the Lord. So the, the short answer to my long statement is even if you know or suspect that they may have evil intent or even be doing evil, we don't get a pass because we still represent Jesus. Right, yeah, I know, but, but I'm saying we don't follow that evil with Oh well, we, we just back off and yeah, or, no, we or, don't. We or, or it, yeah. Or, or or we can say, hey, that's wrong. Oh, that's no, do that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah, no, I mean you under no circumstances under no circumstances is a believer justified in in knowingly doing evil. Right. Yeah. Right. Under no circumstances. Because what again, what does the scripture say? Whatever you do in word or deed, do it as unto the Lord. Right. So under no circumstance am I justified in doing evil, even if Everybody else on the business, on the plant is doing evil. What I should do maybe is look for another job, <laughs> but but I'm not going to do evil because everybody else is doing evil. Right. Exactly, and that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not going to do evil just for evil. I'm right. Gonna, right. You know, I'm going right. To, you know, it's good. For, you know, do what the word says. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Good question. That's a real life question. I appreciate that. Does anybody else have any observations or questions or, or prayer requests as we get ready to close out? Yes. Yes.
because uh, it's hard. <laughs> the Bible says it's hard to kick against the prison. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We're supposed to be a brotherhood, a royal priesthood. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. as long as we separate ourselves from each other, we will never be the royal priesthood able to offer up spiritual sacrifices. You are. God told us to be priests. And this lesson you taught tonight emphasizes. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Glenn. Uh, thank you, Brother Glenn. I really appreciate your observations there, and it's so true. We live in a time where we have to recognize we are under fire, and we still have to represent the, the, you know, the purpose that we've been called. We, we're in this situation for a reason. So I'm going to close out the lines now so that we can close with prayer, as I, I hear a lot of background, and I want to make sure we close out right now. Uh, so let me do that. Uh, so we're going to close out right now, and I do want to, I do want to ask that you would all keep in prayer those who, are in mind, those who are on our prayer list. As we opened up our lesson tonight, we opened up with a prayer for uh, for those who are victims of the latest shooting. Uh, we also uh, want to keep in mind that there are people all across this nation that are going through uh, various uh, issues right now. We're we're in a very difficult period. Uh, uh, there's so much going on, so we just need to keep praying. We also want to keep in mind that there's some on our prayer list. We want to continue to pray for Brother John Glenn and his wife, Gloria. Uh, we also want to pray for uh, Rosa Henderson, uh, mother of, at uh, Seed of Faith, who has uh, had a stroke uh, just a few days ago. We want to keep her in our prayers. We, we want to continue to uh, pray for uh, Carol Allen and Chantel Hackett. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Kathy Bowman and uh, Annie Bowman. Uh, we want to continue to lift up um, Alice Bronson, Mother Aurelia Harrison in Louisiana. God bless you, Mother. I don't know if you're on tonight, but you've been going through some things there in Louisiana, but you're faithful in being with us week after week. Uh, we we want to continue to lift, lift you up as well. Uh, we want to pray for Sister Piper Lott and her family. Uh, we thank God for your faithfulness. Uh, Kim Bur uh, uh, Birmingham and we want to continue to pray for her. Um, let's pray for Sister Mariah Sakara and Dorothy Robinson, uh, Dorothy Atkinson. Uh, we thank God for all of you who, for your faithfulness. And we're going to close out tonight with prayer. I want to say one thing before, before I pray. Um, our brothers, men, uh, this is the fourth uh, Friday coming up. So all the men are encouraged to call in at 7 p.m. on this Friday, a couple days from now, for our huddle. I've got a really good... A little discussion that I want to have with you will be on the line from 7 to 8 p.m. on our conference line. So you don't get it on Facebook Live. If you want to participate, man, you have to call into our conference line, which is 515 area code 603-3156. That's 515-603-3156. The access code is 145 236 145 236 7 p.m. on this Friday brothers we have a huddle 
and we've got some real good things to share with you. We'll be online for an hour. So let's pray out. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. We ran a little over tonight, those who stayed with us, uh, but we had some good discussion. Let's pray out. Father, I thank you for this time that you've given us in your word. Lord, it, it speaks so clearly to us that our conduct matters to you. Now that we recognize who we are, we must present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, which is our reasonable service. We must not be conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We have some things to prove. So, Lord, as we face the things that are uh, around us, Lord, we want to prove that we are not the same as we used to be. We thank you, God, that there's so much that you are still doing in our lives. We pray for those who are victims of senseless violence. We pray for the body of Christ, Lord, that you would help us, Lord God, to continue to, to shine even in the darkest of places. And I God, Lord God, I pray that you continue to watch over and protect us until we are able to come together again in your presence. It all is for a reason. Thank you, God, for everything you've done. Now may the grace of God and the communion of his spirit be upon you until we meet again. Remember this, God loves you, so do I, and there's not a thing you can do about it. Until next time, we'll see you soon. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. We'll look to see you next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Be blessed.